My role in this project was to commission artists and communities to be involved in art projects inside and on the outside of the new centre. My name is Pippa Sanderson. I'm the Community Arts Advisor here at Council, Hutt City Council. So the first project that I commissioned was a series of concrete panel designs from local artists. Designs were commissioned to go on the concrete panels around the outside of the building and they were the first art project that people have seen. Another project was the projects that the Film for Change folk have been involved in and that was a series of films made by kids. In this particular project we're engaging with the local community um, and getting kids of all ages involved to hear local stories, to come up with their own and to learn how to make them into film. Another project I commissioned was a mural that involved the artist Shane Tuffery working with local community to paint a mural. So the aim of the mural project was again the aim of the art projects which was to involve the local community in developing artworks for the Titus Centre. My name is Shane Tuffrey, I'm a visual artist and recently I've ventured out into painting murals, uh, helping the community design and um, execute murals. Uh, we, we did four workshops, we were in the Pomari Community Hall and we just got out some wooden tables, some newspaper and whole lot of materials and invited the public to come along. You have to involve the community and uh, I like doing it because it's, uh, you get their input because it's theirs uh, at the end and they have to look at it every day. Uh, so um, it's really important they have input. You can't do some arty farty thing out there where people don't understand it, you're going to do something that tells a story and connects them. That's the beauty of murals. The last project that I commissioned was a flags project and that was um, organised in partnership with Jen Boland and Jolie Degaya from the education team at the DAS. Our goal was to create a sense of belonging in the centre and to get the kids thinking about how the centre was going to become a part of their neighbourhood before it actually opened. The project started when Pippa Sanderson and I sat down and we had a big brainstorm about a collaborative artwork that we could do that involved as many kids as possible and we just decided oh, what would be really great would be to do flags and then hang them as buntings in the new concourse. So when the kids get there they'll look up and they'll see themselves in the centre. We had the pleasure of working with seven different schools. We had Wilford School, St Michael's School, Paul Marie, Avalon Intermediate, Titus Central, Rada Street and Dyer Street. And then we also went to the Kids Connect Hui. And we wanted to be able to capture the kids' thoughts for the future and their hopes and their dreams. So they were thinking about one main idea and a symbol that could represent that. And they could choose whether or not they used words or symbols or pictures. This is three. There's another 850 hanging from the ceiling. So there's value aesthetically in the space, but the value is greater than that because it's about the belonging. It's about those kids having an idea that they are already in that centre and when they go, they'll recognise their place in it and they'll feel welcome. To have you know, artwork in there I think just makes it feel human, it makes a connection to local. I think people will be able to see themselves in the mural and in the, the flags project. Um, the concrete panels on the outside in particular are just uh, gorgeous. I moved here in 1984 after coming back from Taranaki and stuff. Lived in town for, from 78 to 84 and then moved out here. So 84 to now, that's a bit of a spell being here. And I've seen this neighbourhood pick up, drop down, empty out, pull up, pick up, drop down and empty out and then boot it out. <laughs> And that's what I've seen, you know, in, in, over the years. The, the, the people are changing. You know, pretty much Paul Murray was just Islander, Māori community. The only white people that used to wind up on the street is because they go with either a Māori girl 
or the married girls came with a paggy guy. And they all the boys in the islanders go with a white guy. They usually used to wind up in Paul Murray. <laughs> I think the community out in Pumari and Taita is amazing. I think it's diverse, um, very community focused and very cultural. I mean the talent that's out here is just amazing. This place is just oozing talent from the music to the sports to the the academics to the, you name it, they come from this, they come from this space. And so, yeah, we need to, we need to celebrate the richness of and diversity of this space. I am an African child who had never imagined of herself being here today. Even though I live in um, New Zealand and is surrounded by New Zealand cultures, I am still proud of my culture. And so I hope to keep all my aspects of my culture as I grow up, e.g. language, food, festivals, and clothes. I am an African child. I was such a shy, clever, illiterate girl, despite not able to read nor write. The struggles I faced to the chances I took Every move I made and every step I took on the way, these are I'm going to remember the most in my life. I am giving every opportunity a chance and leaving no rooms for regrets. I am an African child. The experience of my life here has formed the way I view the world and helped me to become understanding of a need, compassion towards other people from different backgrounds than my own. The art sketches I sketch allows me to escape from reality and go into my own wonderland. Music is my rhythm, the rhythm to my life, the rhythm that keeps me going. I am an African child. Not because I was born there, but because that's where my heart beats. Therefore, for my skin tone to my human being, my black colour is my pride, chocolate, the taste of delight. I am extraordinary. I am me and no one will ever change who I am, my belief, my culture and my pride. Beauty begins the moment you decide to be yourself. Let go of who you think you need to be and just be who you actually are. I am far from perfection but my beauty is a reflection of my tribes. I am an African child, pride, proud of being me. I am open to all possibilities. I am free to be me and I am full of love, music, joy, flavour and creativity. I am an African child. I am happy with whom I am and I am yet to become. Remind yourself that no one in the entire world is perfect. We are all unique but in our own ways. I make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Those who don't learn make mistakes don't really learn from their wrongs. The struggles we are in today are developing the strength we need for the future days to come. I am an African child. My culture is my story of which I am, but grateful I had the opportunity to grow, to grow up in a different country than my own. I am an African child, yet still a believer of Africa, and always will be my home. I am black on the cover, but bright on the inside. I am an African child, deep down in my roots, from my heart. I was born African and lived the life I had never imagined of living. Thank you. When I first came to Pumari, I didn't become involved with the community until I was asked to by um, the, the, the community house coordinator and that's when the community house was in the glade. My children have been involved with the community since you know, they all grew up here, my adult children and same with my grandchildren.
all my life has been flowing through somewhere around the Tata Pumata area. There's a lot of um, memories of the old parks from being little. I got married in the old community centre, so I've got a really, really good memory of that. Um, lots of singing and dancing, and my parents were uh, both alive then, and my in-laws were both alive then, and all their families, so yeah. Lots of 21sts. We went to the um, centre for 21sts and weddings. We had big Tida's Got Talent play groups that went on at the um, Tida Community Hall. That was a great place because anyone could go in there and hire that hall. But this is going to be a lot more specific things going on in that space that you wouldn't have been able to just set up in a hall. <laughs> The first project uh, that I commissioned was a series of concrete panel designs from local artists uh, that I found by working with um, a woman called Sue Ray, local community weaver. These um, designs were commissioned to go on the concrete panels around the outside of the building and they were the first art project that people have seen and they're up there at the moment. I'm one of the artists who contributed to the designs for the concrete panels on the Taida Community Centre and my role has just basically been as one of the artists and working in conjunction with um, the other two artists. Well, my name is Takari, Takari William. Uh, I've lived in Taita for the last three years. Also I've been, been, been involved in a few art projects in Taita itself and Paul Murray. Oh, my name is Everybody called me Tua, but my whole name is Tua Lao Fare. I've been here for 25 years, 25, 26. I've basically used two motifs in the design. Uh, one is the uh, river. If you look at the river from a bird's eye view, if you go onto Google Maps, you see the river wandering around like that. And, and the Taratara Akai uh, motif from Maori carving, which is, um, symbolises, it's quite often used on a pātaka, which is a food storehouse. This is what I've been doing. Uh, it's a common one, it's a tokelau for the toa there. And this one is like a uh, river. You can running along and great warrior can throw on a boat and a canoe, wherever they want to go. This represents a, a kaitiaki or um, guardian, which is represented by this figure up the top here. It's in manaya form. Uh, the foot and the hand, they actually sit along the top end of the river, and the, and the river flows this here which goes out into the harbour. Also these, these patterns, they also represent the, um, uh, the different ethnic groups of, of, of Taita and Port Pomare area. And um, it just suggests the unity of all people here. Uh, I can't wait to see it, um, plus all the other artists that are involved in, in this project too. I think we all have the same the same feeling that you may would love to see this our work up there and and see it on, on these big panels that we made. Just can't really imagine it until we see it. Is it because of the size of it, yeah. People seem to enjoy the fact that the panels are thematically related to the people who live in the area because of the Maori and Pacific Island input. I think that they respond to the fact and enjoy the fact that the architecture has those elements incorporated into it. Uh, it is a community centre. It's in amongst this community of people here for their use. So 
as they take ownership of it, it's an inevitability that um, they will contribute just by using the centre, you know, and when the project is finished, and um, that it will take on the flavour and the culture of the people who use it. I think the facilities that the centre offers are going to be incredible. Um, from gymnasium, where you know local people can ha can have in the, the latest gym equipment on their doorstep. Um, from a stadium that not only will be featured in key sporting events, it can be used for many other social and cultural events. To um, an incredible state-of-the-art library, which will not only offer resources and information but also um, the opportunity to connect with the internet and, and share the wider world. It'll also have a classroom for kids to have state-of-the-art learning and seminar rooms for us to present a wide variety of learning opportunities. It's probably a hub for all the young people to come that, you know, are, are interested in something else. Apart from exercising and being fit and getting gold medals if they get it to the Olympics. Who knows? But, you know, it might keep the children occupied. It might keep sick people a little bit more healthier. People are going to get curious and use it for a little while and see what happens. <laughs> Yeah, I've got not much choice. I'm, I'm just down the road three minutes on tired of drive, straight through the alleyway, boom, I'm there. <laughs> that could be my new breakfast house. I reckon Pormat is good for another hundred years. I had great expectations for the project. I think I found out about it close to a year ago when Helen at some point just mentioned, oh, we're going to be working out in Taita Pomara again and there's going to be a workshop when we'll be teaching kids how to make films. And I thought, I need to do this. I'm in. I love working with kids, um, I really do. I love the work that Film for Change does and I really enjoy being part of it. So I feel this is bringing two of the things that I really enjoy doing together, which is great. And basically what we did is we went out and we gathered some local stories and let the kids hear those and then we encouraged the kids to come up with their own stories which we turned into sort of fun local legends. They were exposed to a whole lot of local legends but then they were allowed to take it truly as children do and turn it upside down and make their own stories and that's okay that's that's what this was about this was about children being able to be creative and and express their stories in a different way. That's a huge part of filmmaking is to be able to tell a story and there are heaps of kids out there that don't have that kind of opportunity so what we thought we should do is that we could go to Taita in Pomare um, Primary School and we sort of work with these kids, teach them how to sort of get their creativity and their ideas down on paper and then eventually just turn it into like an awesome short film. The Taita Pomari community was such a big help in running these workshops and making these films because we had volunteers from all over. We all just came together to reach for a common goal and it really goes to show the power of community in achieving those kinds of goals. We had five workshops in total. Um, the first workshop we took the kids out on a bus when the bus turned up. Um, that was the first challenge of the whole thing. Um, 
and we went and heard different locals telling different legends and stories about the local area. But his friend Nucky was very different. He was, he never kept still. He was the sort of tiny father that ran around all over the place. Well, he couldn't run, he swung. And he went round and round and round and round out there. And when he was bored, he would do great big leaps and he would leap right over the island. It's quite important in our culture that it's not necessarily hard handed down eldest son to eldest son. But in Māori we pass it down to the most able. And we Takunatata was considered the most able person in the tribe. The second day was about learning how to tell your own stories and script writing. We started off by um, exercising the kids' creativity and seeing how they tell stories and what kind of stories they come up with. And then we sort of developed that idea by getting them to brainstorm, write it down, and then we structured it into a story and then eventually we gave them the skills that they needed to make these films happen. When we were coming up with the scripts, I thought I was going to have to be guiding these kids through the basics of narrative structure. You know, something good happens, but then something bad happens. They just dove right in and put out this incredibly imaginative uh, version of their local history. You, you would think that um, the kids would come up with certain ideas, you know, you'd be like, oh yeah, they'll, they'll write about this and this and this, but their minds are so uncontrollable and they just came up with these incredible stories that I, don't, I wouldn't have never even thought of, and I think that's the beauty of it. Rosietta saw everything and decided to reward their friendship by turning them back into Mataitai and making him a prince. The third day was about preparing the props and the costumes and the sets for the films. Yes, I think what we can do is come here, there's some rocks. Also working on how the kids will be using the equipment. So we started teaching them how to use the camera and the sound equipment and what levels to look out for, how to frame an image. <laughs> I think the only thing is that the Tanifa may need to be closer to the camera because they will not the set up. The fourth day we spent shooting one of the kids' films and they all had a, such a great time. The thing I learned was being quiet and working as a team. The music has to suit the type of movie and like the speed, the tempo and everything. Everyone was being creative and working as a team. Facial expressions tell a lot about a story. Everyone of the team is important. Everybody was allowed to have a turn at doing everything and I think that was a really neat process. In the last workshop, in workshop number five, um, we were filming the second film. And by that time, we already had reps on the first one um, and we managed to bring a rough cut along uh, to show the kids. So about halfway through the last workshop, we huddled around the computer and watched all 90 seconds uh, of, the, of the first film together with the kids. And it was amazing, to see, amazing for me to see them glued to the screen, but also for them to see what it is that they have achieved. We turned up a bunch of filmmakers and who had worked with kids a couple of times before but not that much and the community really gave us an opportunity to just give it a go and that's what the whole sort of ethos of the workshops was was just getting in there and seeing if we could make it happen. My favourite part of the workshop was going to the dance, acting, filming and uh, costume making, filming, the directing and sort of choosing the scenes, painting, Getting to know everyone's name. Acting. Sketching. Making the costume. Going to the museum. Even though that we were there with our skills and all of our equipment and stuff, they were the ones who really led the project. The Film for Change team did not, were not intrusive in it. They allowed the children <laughs> to, to, to lead it and go where the children wanted to go. It went really well. I think the kids really enjoyed what and were proud of what they came up with. I certainly hope that we can run this program again. I think if we run it again, I'll be happy.
Over a hundred years ago in Aotearoa, there lived a hungry hoya bird named Remodiora. Because of a short beak, Remodiora was having trouble reaching the bugs deep inside the tree trunk. It's hard for me to get food. I'm hungry. This is frustrating. Remodiora saw Atahua and had an idea. Hey beautiful, you have a different kind of beak. Maybe you can help me. Okay. Suddenly the ground began to shake and two of the two hoya birds became scared and ran away. Can you help me find my friend? Yeah, dude, why not? Your friend might be over here. I found her. Yay. But their happiness didn't last long. Sooner the wind started to blow louder and faster and stronger as a hurricane blew them away. Atahua landed somewhere near a river, but Moriora was nowhere to be seen. Why are you so sad? I'm lost and I can't find my friends. Oh, don't worry, I'll help you find him. Look, here he is. Atahua! But it wasn't a happy ending for the Hoya bird. In the early 1900s, the Hoya bird became extinct due to overhunting and deforestation. The end. Once upon a time, there was a man called Natai. He found a golden fish on the shore. Natai wanted to take the fish home, but he couldn't decide what to do with it. Should he eat it, or should he sell it? But the golden fish belonged to a mermaid called Rosita. And she turned Natai into two tiny fur, Maki and Taitai. Maki wanted to play with the golden fish, for Tai Tai wanted to eat it. The two tiny fowl couldn't decide who should get the golden fish, so they fought each other. Maki and Fatata agreed that they should fight in more and neither of them should eat or play with the golden fish because it wouldn't be fair to each other. Rosetta saw everything and decided to reward their friendship by turning them back into Matata and making him a prince. The end. I really hope that this centre is a catalyst for a really positive change in this community. It may not have everything that everyone wants, but it's a real foundation. I think a lot of the sports people who use the centre will use it because of the facilities, amazing facilities and you know amazing usage from the sporting groups. But that's only half the centre. The other half is focuses on the community and having them involved, having them fully engaged, they have to have ownership. It's really important that that place is a place where we go and we celebrate all the talent Taita is made of and Pōmare is made of. And I'd love to see somewhere in there 
depictions of the Haast Eagle and the Huia. The Huia is gone. Ko te oha ki tēne a te Huia. This is the farewell message of the Huia. Hui, Hui, Huia. Come together. So it's a play on words. The Huia was a bird that was in this area that is now extinct. We didn't care. We didn't care enough for that bird that it still is with us today. So that's the farewell message of the huia, is come together. And surely that is what te mako is all about. Calling us to come together, calling us to be together and share.